Hello, Canucks fans. Welcome back to another episode of Canucks Conversation, brought to you, as always, by the 2023 Toyota BZ4X. The BZ4X is packed with Toyota's coolest tech, and it still has that trusty SUV feel you know and love. And even though it's electric, it's capable of effortlessly conquering any terrain, whether it's rain, snow, mud, or your friend's questionable post-game recaps, the BZ4X will get you through it all. And of course, that is Toyota's brand new all-electric SUV designed to go the distance for you and your family. David Quadrelli, alongside Harmon Dial, our man at the controls, our producer, is Grady Sass. Harm's got the sauna behind him. I said it yesterday. It's going to be a show from the sauna, and here we are. We're not from the sauna. For those on podcast, they, they'd feel really left out if they were listening to this and thought we were doing it from the sauna. Not today. Not today. Maybe one day. If, okay, Harm, if the Canucks win the cup, you do a show from inside the sauna. doesn't have to be on, but you do it from inside. Sure, 100%. If they do the cup, I'll, I'll do a lot more than that. Turn on the sauna? Sure, yeah. I can't guarantee right. how long I'll be able to keep it on. And um, and it might fry my microphone, my laptop <laughs> in the process, but we'll give it a go at least for the start of the show. Put on a sweatsuit, you know, ride the treadmill, get a workout bike, get it all. You know those portable saunas? Like the the ones that you... I don't know. I've seen them on like the, the weird fighters? Instagram ads you get. No, no, no. Like the ones I see are like mom sitting at a soccer game. <laughs> like those are the ones I've seen. And they're sitting in this weird. like portable sauna thing. Anyways, maybe I'm Some alone on this. Someone out, there, ads. Yeah, someone out there seen these, I'm sure. Uh, but anyways, Harm, we've got a lot of business to get to. So let's get to it. Uh, quickly, going to preview the show for everybody. So first, we're going to talk about the Canucks taking on the fraudulent Sabres. And then we're going to talk to Jeff Patterson to kind of preview the game a little bit more. And then after that, in anyone else... We're going to talk about our best lineups with and without Dakota Joshua. So, folks, it's a busy show. Thanks for joining us today. It's going to be a real good show. And we had someone in the chat immediately. Breakaway Books in the chat said, I really like Quad's suggestion about the season's last 20 games being a tournament for those who missed the playoffs determining the draft order. Fantastic idea. Who did he borrow it from? And again, I'll remind everybody, that was the PWHL. That's the PWHL doing that. And I'm once again banging the drum that this needs to be something we see across all sports leagues. But let's talk about the Canucks. Let's talk about the Canucks arm. Uh, the Vancouver Canucks take on the Buffalo Sabres tonight. The surging Buffalo Sabres, if you look at Twitter. 6-3-1 uh, and one in their last 10. I'm not buying anything that Sabres are selling personally. And I said that yesterday. Yeah, and from a Canucks perspective, it's Buffalo's second leg of the back-to-back. -back. They just played in Seattle, beat them. Uh, last night, they're probably not going to start uh, Yuko Pekka Lukanen, who's been terrific, quietly having one of the uh, most under-the-radar breakout seasons in the NHL. And I actually did a national piece today looking at some of those under-the-radar most improved players. Nils Hoaglander was on that list, for example. Uh, and Lukanen was on that list because he's rocking a 930 save percentage uh, since January 1st. And even for the season as a whole, He's top five among all NHL goalies, according to Evolving Hockey's goal saved above expected model. So looking at the quality of the shots and chances he's facing, he saved like 22 goals above expected. He's right behind Demko. I think the order goes Hellebuck number one. It's Bennington and Markstrom in some order, two and three. I can't remember who's number two and who's number three, but Bennington and Markstrom are top three behind Hellebuck. Then it's Demko, and then it's um, it's UPL, uh, which is his nickname. Uh, so. He was terrific last night. I imagine he won't get the start um, tonight. And even if he does for some reason, a uh, goalie's on the second leg of a back-to-back. -back. It's statistically proven that uh, their performance drops off sharply. He's been one of the main reasons they've been surging because you think back to the start of the season, it was supposed to be Devin Levi, who was uh, the number one goaltender, star NCAA prospect, was acquired in the Sam Reinhardt trade, uh, was pretty effective in seven games down the stretch last season, whereas... Uh, Lukanen, he had like an 892 save percentage last season. So the thought process was, okay, Levi is going to be our number one. Struggled through the first 20 games. Now the Sabres don't defend well, so that's part of the story. But he was sent down to the AHL for a chunk there. And um, their second half surge has been driven in large part by goaltending. That's an advantage that's kind of taken away uh, against the Canucks tonight. UPL is a really interesting case study, and I'm, I don't want to move too far away from the Buffalo Sabres, but if you go look at UPL's numbers and kind of his road to the NHL, he's 25 years old now. There was a time when he was the best goalie in the OHL, and, you know, he was actually wrestling for that title a bit with 
Mikey DiPietro in that season, the 2018-19 season, they were the two best goalies in the league. That Hands down, they were the two best goalies in the league. But, uh, you know, you could debate who was the best during that season. Uh, UPL put up a 920 save percentage in that season. But the point that I'm trying to make, Harm, is that like he bounced around the AHL. He had to play in the ECHL. He got blown back to Finland because he wasn't having much success in North America in the AHL. Um, and the ECHL, his numbers were better. But again, he got loaned back to Finland. And he was kind of up and down. He was all over the place. And you weren't really sure if this guy was going to hit. 25 years old, he's having his breakout season. It just reminds me a little bit about Archer Seelovs in that even though he's having a bit of a down year this year, there's still hope for Seelovs, right? Like, there again, we might see him in an NH NHL game at some point here. But, you know, I just... A lot of people ready to give up on Seelovs after, you know, Tolapil has kind of emerged and come, burst onto the scene. The goalies take time. Goalies take time. And I know you heard that for years with all of your levies take time. Uh, power forwards take time. All this. You've heard all that all these years as Canucks fans. But goalies sometimes do take the scenic route and they do take a little bit longer to develop. So I'm glad, glad you brought up UPL. The other funny thing about uh, Uko Pekka Lukanen is that he is our friend Brent Batchelor. He's a uh, Brennan Bachelor's warm up guy. I don't know if you knew this. Do you, do you know yeah. what I'm talking about? Yeah. yeah. So for those that don't know, I can't remember the sentence he says, but Batch, has, for years before UPL's even been in the league, he says to himself like 10 times fast, he goes, Yuko Pekka Lukanen picked up a bottle of pickled peppers or whatever it is he says, right? And he has this whole line, and I love it. I loved it. And I told Batch if he could slip it into a uh, broadcast, I would be very, very impressed. But, anyways, yes, um, Yuko Pekka Lukanen. Not going to start in goal for the Buffalo Sabres tonight. So, of course, we had to talk about it for the for five, ten minutes there. But uh, the guys who are starting for the Buffalo Sabres, Harm, uh, what are you looking for from the Buffalo Sabres forward and defense group tonight? Yeah, it feels like Tage Thompson is finally heating up. He's had a disappointing year, uh, plagued by injuries. He, at one point, blocked a shot, I believe, around November or December and, um, and had a hand or, or wrist injury, which for an elite sniper like that, it's um it's even when he returns healthy it's going to impact his uh his shooting ability and you could tell he came back just three weeks after the injury probably rushing to help the sabers get back into, into this playoff push he was initially playing with a brace and for a long time this is a guy that after a 47 goal 94 point season last year just didn't look like himself at all the last handful of games i think he's got uh six points in his last in, in his last five games had a goal and assist the other night in uh in Seattle, it feels like he's starting to heat up. And what's interesting when you look at why Thompson, outside of the injury factors, has taken a step back this season, and a large part of why the Sabres as a team have taken a step back this season, is because on the power play, keep in mind that the Sabres were the third highest scoring team in the NHL last year. And a lot of it was driven by their power play. A lot of it was driven by Tage Thompson, especially his one-timer. And I think teams have started scouting that because I looked at the numbers last week for a different national piece and Thompson's shot and goal rate off one timers has fallen off a cliff compared to last season. Now, I don't know, know in the last few games if uh, if that's picked back up again, but that's going to be something to keep an eye on, especially if uh, if the Sabres start um, start drawing some penalties is you've got to be mindful of of that one timer. And if you can take that away from him. That's a massive part of uh, of being able to slow him down. And then on the back end, I'm really intrigued to see Bowen Byram. It feels like he's um, had a new lease on life in uh, in Buffalo. We know how talented he is, the uh, the tremendous promise and ceiling he has. But he was struggling in Colorado, sort of playing further down the lineup. Now he's in a top pair role uh, next to Rasmus Dahlin. And when you think about how... Quinn Hughes, the best partner for him was another offensive defenseman in Philip Ronick. That seems to now be the playbook that the Sabres are also leaning on um, in um, in pairing Byram and Dallin together. That's going to be one heck of an offensive pair. They might have some defensive struggles, of course, but dynamic skating, um, puck moving ability, offensive instincts, they're going to be really fun to watch. Uh, Canucks going with some new lines tonight. And Grady, can we pull these up here? These are the new lines that the Canucks are going to go with. And this matters, folks, because in anyone else, we're going to bring it up. And of course, in a matter of moments, we will ask Jeff Patterson for his thoughts on these lines. But these are the new lines that we saw rolled out at Canucks practice yesterday. It's expected that they will go with this forward group tonight. Uh, again, we saw a bit of a shakeup to the defense pairs as well. One second here. 
Okay, Grady's going to pull up the lines, but for those on the podcast, I'll read you the lines. And those on the YouTube live show, you're going to have to listen to me talk about the lines. But we briefly touched on it yesterday, Harm. Elias Pearson playing with Connor Garland and Niels Hoaglander. I talked about yesterday how I really like that. I really like that Elias Pearson's getting the chance to play with legitimately two of the Canucks' best five-on-five producers this season, right? Like, there's no more Sam Lafferty. There's none of this. Okay, we're going to try to make this work. You got to carry these wingers. Like, Elias Patterson has got to make it work with Connor Garland and Nils Hoagland. I know one thing you said yesterday was, you know, that Connor Garland hasn't been able to find much success with Elias Patterson. I'm hoping that tonight we're going to see kind of a, a different, different look for those two together. I think part of the thought process potentially for talking and constructing this line together is maybe thinking that, okay, in Hoagland and Garland, you've got two of your most tenacious high motor wingers who just win battles all over the ice are, are massive uh, pains in the rear on the four check. And I wonder if part of that is okay. Pedersen as a center, he's going to be the F3. He's going to be sort of above the play. If he now has wingers that can win those battles down low, that, it can perhaps help that line spend more time in the offensive zone that it can even spark Pedersen's own four checking game. Because when he's at his best, he's able to pick off a lot of passes. He's able to use his anticipation to create problems for the opposition as well. So I wonder if that's part of the rationale in, um, in moving Garland up the lineup to play with Pedersen beyond just the Garland's a pretty good uh, playmaker and bring some offensive value aspect. A guy who's not getting the best wingers tonight. Elias Lindholm playing with Sam Lafferty and Ilya Mikheyev. Of course, that second line Miller, Besser, Suter. No surprise there. But Mikheyev, Lindholm, Lafferty. I, again, I, we're going to get to it in anyone else because we both made some lineups here. I don't know what to do with Elias Lindholm. Like, you need to get Elias Lindholm going. And I really think the place to do that is the top six. Like, I would think maybe you move Garland down to the Miller, Besser line and then Lindholm goes up to play on the wing with Elias Pedersen. But, I just don't know because I'm just trying to look at this through the lens of what's going to work by playoff time. And it just feels like that bottom six right now isn't going to be able to work during playoffs. And look, when you get Dakota Joshua back, obviously this lineup looks different, but I don't know, Harm. I'm struggling. I'm struggling to figure out what this bottom six is going to be able to do tonight. But hey, hopefully, maybe they'll go out and score a few goals. I just, I look at that bottom six and it just looks like, okay, these are the rest of our guys. Let's put them all down there. It really does feel like that. Uh, Again, as I sort of mentioned on last on last show, I wonder if part of the logic is also just give Lindholm some speed. But the problem is Mikheyev and Lafferty just don't have enough offensive touch to uh, be creating scoring chances. And you can't rely on Lindholm to drive offense because as we've seen, he's more of a complimentary supporting player rather than somebody that has a dynamic skill to uh, create plays and, and elevate other uh, other players. So I'm with you. I think it's going to have to be the top six that really carries the mail for this uh, for this team, which um, for a large chunk of especially the first half of the season and up until the All-Star break, they didn't need to put that type of pressure on the top six because, yeah, the top six was effective most of the way. But when they did have an off, not, off night, it they had one of the best third lines in the NHL to bail them out. They definitely don't have that now. So I make them wait any longer. Jeff Patterson waiting in the wings, ready to join us. And Jeff is brought to you by Greta, the home of our electric watch parties. Greta is our spot to chill pregame, postgame, and all through the offseason as well. Just 10 minutes away by walking, of course, from Rogers Arena. Check out Greta Bar YVR today. We're going to have another watch party. It's getting announced soon, folks. We're going to have a watch party. It's going to be a lot of fun. But one event we're going to have, um, and we'll talk about it with Jeff as well later on, uh, is the event. Actually, let's, let's talk about it right now. Jeff, we've already told people about it. Saturday, April 20th at the Hollywood Theater in Kitsilano. Special tribute to our friend Jason Botchford. And, of course, um, you know, talking about the Canucks playoffs as well. It's going to be a fun event, and you're going to be a big part of that event as well. Yeah, uh, I'm looking forward to it. And, uh, you know... It, Botch obviously didn't get a chance to cover a lot of playoff hockey as uh, those of us that have been on the beat for a while. And so uh, his final season covering this team was 2018-19 and the draft that was held here in Vancouver and Bud Colson's draft year, but certainly wasn't any playoff hockey for the Vancouver Canucks. And then uh, in the bubble, uh, unfortunately, Jason wasn't with us. And uh, so, yes, I think it's uh, it's trying to be a celebration 
of the return of playoff hockey while we honor Jason's legacy. So there'll be lots of bot stories, some that have probably been told uh, a bunch of times, maybe some new ones that have been unearthed along the way. Uh, but, uh, you know, all with an eye to playoff hockey, whatever that looks like for the Vancouver Canucks, as long as it's going to last, we'll see. Again, so many balls in the air about where they're going to finish and uh, where other teams are going to finish when the dust settles. So still too soon to try. I know you guys were trying to pick playoff opponents the other day, but uh, <laughs> sort of a fruitless mission there. But uh, uh, the night at the Commodore uh, back in 2019 was an amazing night. Uh, I don't know that this is going to uh, be a replication of that. I think there'll be some similarities, but uh uh, yeah, I mean, the bottom line is the Canucks are returning to the playoffs. They haven't quite clinched their spot yet, but they're going to. Uh, and unfortunately, we won't have Botch around to cover it and document it, but uh, he'll be there in spirit. And uh, so, yeah, if people are looking for a little uh, pre-playoff fun, uh, good afternoon on uh, the 20th of April. Uh, make plans to come out and join us at the Hollywood. Going to be a good time. Going to be a great time. Okay, Jeff, final month of the season here. Playoffs start mm -hmm. on April 20th. Like, that's when the Stanley Cup playoffs start here. Biggest question facing the Canucks. I, I wrote it for Canucks Army today. I wrote down five. Tried to pick five. What's the biggest question facing this team? I'll tell you mine. Mine's the power play. Mine is unequivocally the power play. But what do you think is the biggest question facing this team down the final month of the season and heading into the playoffs? Well, let the record show that I read your, your piece. So I, I don't want to sound like I'm stealing, but you had so many good options there. Uh, I think for me, it's just best players. And are they going to be up to the challenge? And that dovetails into the power play, certainly. But, you know, all we have to go on is the bubble, which was the most unique experience that anybody is ever going to experience uh, at that level in the National Hockey League. Now, guys like Elias Pettersson and Quinn Hughes in their first look at playoff hockey came through with flying colors. And we all know that they pushed Vegas in that second round. Uh, you know, it's funny the other day talking to Brock Besser and just asking him if he was starting to view everything through a playoff prism. And quite frankly, I was shocked to hear his answer where he said, I haven't played in the playoffs technically. And he dropped the technically in there. But I thought, isn't that interesting? Like, that's how he views that bubble experience. Like, there was intensity. Okay, maybe the St. Louis Blues as the defending champs didn't have the intensity. But those Vegas games, you had to grind for every inch available. Like, I think the hockey on the ice, once the puck dropped, it replicated some degree of playoff hockey, but nobody in the stands. You don't have to go into hostile environments. Uh, you know, it certainly you didn't have to travel. And, and and so, yes, this wasn't the true test of playoff hockey. So guys like Besser and Demko and Patterson and Hughes, uh, they are going to have to learn on the fly. And I guess for me, uh, the question is, will they be up to the challenge? And for me, playoff hockey is all about matchups, right? Like, and again, you don't know who they're going to draw. But it's about matchups, and then it's about adjustments. Like the team that loses that opener, it's on them to make the necessary adjustments so that they don't fall down to nothing. And then if you're the team that gets up, if the other team comes back, then it's on you to, you know, figure out with a couple of games under your belt now, you know, what's worked for you, what hasn't. And so I love the chess match between the coaches. I love the fact, like the you know road team doesn't have the like you know we always talk about oh home team last change in the regular season, sure. It means a lot when you can dictate the matchups and if you can get a particular checking line out against the other team's top players, you know, can the Canucks best players fight through that? Now, JT Miller's motor is always running. I don't have much doubt that JT Miller is going to show up and compete and, and be able to produce. Some of these other guys, it is a different animal. And I'm not saying that they won't. And I use the bubble experience as proof that they have been able to elevate. But... I think we all know. I mean, the market's on fire right now about Elias Pettersson and, and kind of how quiet he is. And so it's on him to silence people, to make them eat their words. And I'm not a guy that wants to bet against EP40, but I would like to see some signs of life here over these final 14 games so that this isn't the tone and the, the conversation that's carrying on as they get to games 81 and 82 and ultimately to the first game of the playoffs. So I want to see some signs of life from him. You guys were just talking about the change and we'll see if Garland and Hoaglander can get in and be buzzsaws and, you know, hound pucks for him and, and create some space and all that kind of stuff. And uh, ultimately it's on EP40 though. I just think he's got to dig in a little bit more. He's been fumbling the pucks. He's been fighting the puck, which we're not used to seeing uh, from him. And I just, I'm looking for a smooth game here. One of these nights and uh, it hasn't happened of late, but Every night's a new night. Uh, we saw him run the league essentially in mid-January. So it's there. We know what he's capable of, but certainly would like to see some signs of life from him here uh, as early as tonight. 
what are your thoughts on the new look top nine, especially what are you looking for? Are you uh, excited by these combinations? Not particularly enthused. What are your uh, big picture thoughts there? Yeah, I'm not totally enthused, but again, I sort of get where Rip Talk is coming from that they're a forward short. Like, you know, they missed the opportunity at the trade deadline and their hands were tied a little bit by their own doing to some degree, but this is a team that needed one more scoring winger. And, you know, they keep talking about Dakota Joshua, but you heard Rick talk it this morning. And I asked, like, has there been any kind of setback? And he said, no, just being overly cautious. But for people that keep thinking that he's going to be back today or tomorrow, or it's not going to happen. Like, you know, I, I hope by the end of the homestand, but certainly the three games this week, not anticipating seeing Dakota Joshua. So uh, talking doesn't have that luxury of sort of slotting Joshua back and then building around that. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I was fascinated yesterday when you kind of broke down Garland and Pedersen in their history. Uh, but, you know, there's no reason that it can't work, but it hasn't in the past. So I guess I have uh, somewhat lowered expectations. And, you know, Hoaglander's had an incredible season, but he's got a little bit quiet of late as well. And just he and Petey haven't really uh, been able to manufacture anything. That line with Besser and Miller and tonight's suitor, uh, I think they'll be fine. But I wrote about this on Sunday. Like, if you look who scored the goals, Besser had the goal the other night. McKay have scored for the first time in forever, set up by Miller, and Miller opened the scoring against Colorado. Like, three of the last four goals have been that line. Like, they can't be a one-line team with a power play that's not going anywhere. So there are some alarm bells going off in my head. No panic button yet, but uh, certainly some alarm bells. And then I agree with you, Harm, on that third line. And it was funny because I asked Elias Lindholm today, I said, like, how difficult is this? for you to try to find your game while constantly having new line mates. And there was this massive pause before he answered. And I was like, you don't, you don't even need to answer the question. Like you just sat enough right there. Uh, you could see the wheel spinning. I mean, he was kind of trying to come up with a politically correct answer <laughs> and went with something along the lines of, I know that, you know, that year in Calgary with Gaudreau and, and Kachuk, like that doesn't happen very often. And I'm a veteran and, you know, I just got to make it work. But there was sort of this sigh and a pause, and I thought that said it all. And and it is tough. Like, yes, he needs to do more, but like he really has played with just about everybody in you know just over a month. Like he just continues to get fed new line mates, and now all of a sudden you're asking a guy to find his game with Ilya Mikheyev on one side, who has what the one goal uh, since Christmas, and Sam Lafferty, whose only goal since the one nothing win in Buffalo when he scored the only goal back in mid January pinballed off about four guys in Seattle and eventually bounced off him and Ian. Like he hadn't used his stick to put a puck in the net. So <laughs> that's a big ask for uh, Elias Lindholm right now to try to rediscover the good stuff playing on the line with Mikheyev and, uh, and Lafferty. And then you get a fourth line where, you know, Nils Amon apparently is a better option, at least for tonight than PDG. And they've taken Vasily Podkolzin and lowered him in the lineup. And I think that maybe takes a little bit of pressure off him to produce because he's played six games and there hasn't been a bottom line. He's, he's been all right. He hasn't looked out of place, but I think this is more in a fourth line role, maybe an idea of where he he would be slotted when Dakota Joshua comes back. And I think you just ask him to try to be more of an energy guy, get in on the floor check, be physical, and don't worry so much about producing offense on that line with uh, Teddy Bluger and, and Nils Amon. Jeff, you just said a lot of names there. So this is a good time for me to set you up here because NAR in our YouTube live chat, regular listener and viewer of the show, is asking if we can get a JPAT do something. Who needs to do something here? Well, I think you go back to the Elias Elias. Uh, take your pick. How about both of them? Uh, but I think for me, it's, Eli it's Elias Patterson. I, I think I, I need to see. And again, at the end of the night, like it'd be great if you had a three or four point night and was electric. I don't even need that right now, though. I just, I, I need to, I keep saying dig in. Like, I, you heard Rick talking the night say, like, there's more for a lot of these guys. He's got to get it. That He's got to unlock it. Was it break the seal, I think, was the term he used. Uh, and we all know that there's more there for Elias Pettersson. And so that's what I'm looking for. I'm just looking for a dynamic, a playmaker, a guy that's one step ahead of the opponents when he's got the stick, you know, the puck on his stick, making things happen in the offensive zone. Again, you know, if he sets up his linemates and they don't score, you can't control that. But Pedersen can control his actions, and I am a believer that there's a whole lot more there. Like, forget the contract and all that. I'm just looking at the player right now in isolation, uh, and he's the guy. And, and when he's on, uh, he obviously can carry a team and dominate a hockey game. 
Uh, they're a much better club, obviously, if uh, he's producing. And so he's the guy. And then Lindholm. But again, I just went through the reasons why maybe it's not fair necessarily to have huge expectations on Lindholm. Uh, Lindholm's got to keep doing all the defensive stuff, the face-offs and penalty killing and those types of things, late game situations. Uh, but he does have to find a way to contribute even a little bit here, uh, more than he has over the last 13 or 14 games. Overall, from the team perspective, they've pretty much got a playoff spot locked. Uh, the stakes for finishing first in the Western Conference or even the Pacific Division aren't particularly high, given that you could finish first in the conference and still end up playing Vegas in round one. So given that from a team perspective, it doesn't feel like there's a lot on the line. So going down the stretch, what purpose do you think it sort of serves? Are you... Are you particularly worried about wins and losses, or is it more that you're kind of looking for these individual trends, whether it's Patterson, Lindholm, or, or the power play? What are you kind of looking for down the stretch? What 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 do you actually put stock into? I think they have got away from the staples that talk it talks about. I mean, you look at the two goals that Washington scored the other day. You know, bad turnovers by defensemen, and then that compounding of mistakes that when they're on. You know, mistakes are going to happen. It's a fast sport. The other team's trying to force those mistakes. Like, you have to live with mistakes, but I think you have to make sure that you don't compound them. And we saw that, uh, certainly the Ovechkin goal. I mean, just the entire team running around in its own zone. Uh, I, so I want to see them get back to their staples. I, I want to see them try to eliminate some of those mistakes. And when the mistakes happen, you know, have somebody there to cover up for a buddy. And, and you know, whether it's the guts of the ice is talk, it talks about, like, he has made it abundantly clear what this team has to do to be successful. And for much of the season they have, but for the last couple of games, whatever. But I mean, you were out on that road trip. I mean, the game in Vegas, the game in, uh, they came back against Winnipeg, even the game in Los Angeles. So it took them a while, but once they found their footing in that game, you know, they were on and they gave up, you know, a goal against LA, a goal in Vegas and none against Winnipeg. So it, they're not that far removed from a really successful run, but uh, just the fact that, Colorado and Washington at the first sign of adversity, uh, there was a real sag. And look, they're going to trail in the playoffs. Like they're not going to get the lead and always be in front. And so I want to see them handle adversity a little bit better. Uh, I, I want to see them stick to their staples. And then ultimately, yeah, I mean, I'd like to see the power play go on. Or talk, it was talking about that earlier today that he thinks that they're generating enough looks that it's basically just on the individual players now to finish. And Pedersen had that chance in the, the one power play they had against Washington the other night, and he didn't convert, but a lot of nights he would score on that opportunity. I think they can be a little bit sharper. It looked like Lindholm at practice yesterday is going to get back onto that first unit. So, you know, to me, that's loading up at least as much as the Canucks can do uh, with their offensive players. And we'll see what the power play looks like here. Uh, but you're right. Wins and losses individually, not of, you know, the utmost important right, importance right now, if it's all about, getting into the rhythm and finding their game again over the final 14. But I will say this, Arnold, like, I think it would be massively disappointing to get this far into the season and then have the Oilers, you know, beat you at the wire. Like, I just think that first place in the division, home ice in the first round, but home ice in the second round, if you get through, like, I'm not too worried about the conference. If they get to the third round of the playoffs, this has been a, a massively successful season for a team that really didn't have any kind of expectations of going to the conference final. But if you do have designs on winning around, then I think it's important. You've come this far. You've built this lead. Don't let it slip. Because I think optically, it would serve as a little bit of a letdown. I mean, forget Oiler fans piling on. Uh, you know, they would if uh, they come all the way back and they, they reel in the Canucks. So, I, you know, if they need some things to play for, to me it is just maintain that gap. Uh, try to run the Oilers out of real estate, essentially. With 14 games to go, they've got those games in hand. But you know, if the Canucks can go nine and five over their final 14 games, that's probably, I mean, the Oilers at that point almost have to run the table and uh, the Oilers have some tough games left to, to against Colorado and they still have to go to Toronto and Winnipeg among others. And then they've got the head to head with the Canucks as well. So uh, those are sorts of things that I'm looking for, but I would also say in isolation, I, I don't want to make more of this than it is, but look, they've won one of the first three games on the homestand. Like we all fell into this trap of, come off the road, playing well, nine at home. Like, this is where they're going to put the hammer down. And they've won one of the first three, and they've had some letdowns in two of the three. Like, get it right tonight. You got a Buffalo team that's coming off last night in Seattle. Uh, they played on Saturday, so this is three and four for them. You're talking about the goaltending. If they don't see UPL, like, that's a massive win for the Canucks. 
Devin Levi, if he gets to start, he hasn't played an NHL game since January 24th. Like, test him. Put pucks on net. Make the goalie make some freaking saves instead of missing the target the way they did the other night. And I, you know, I don't think that they've been guilty of that a lot this season. But boy, Rick Tockett sort of held that up. I was surprised he didn't have the stat sheet at the podium on Saturday right <laughs> after the game. But I mean, he he was quick to point out the number of block shots, but just the number that missed the target as well. JT Miller had a couple of looks and you know missed the net by a mile. Like, um, so here's a goalie that hasn't faced NHL shooters. Like he's played well in the AHL, but that's the American League. Like, test him. If, if they see Devin Levi put pucks on net, look, they've got off to great starts in all three games. On the homestand, they've opened the scoring in the first two minutes of, of all three games. So it hasn't been their starts. It's been those lulls later in games. And so I, I just want to see them pounce on a Buffalo team that's a long way from home, uh, has a lot to play for, and is playing reasonably well. But uh, I still think that the Canucks sort of have to get this one right because if there's a lot of noise in the market after two losses, you know, imagine the storylines if they come out of the wrong end of a the score line in this one tonight against the Sabres of all teams. Uh, Jeff, mm-hmm. our next segment here, we're going to give our kind of best lineups with and without Dakota Joshua. I'm not going to make you give yours, but where do you stand on the lotto line? Like, could the lotto line be reunited? Should they be reunited? Where do you stand on the lotto line at this stage? I think I I'd keep that ticket in my back pocket for when they're down or even tied in games, you know, and you need some juice, as Tockett likes to say. Uh, you know, I, I, I do think that there's enough there. And again, they don't have to go to Joshua right now. But when they get Joshua back, I still think that this can be a three-line team. But I think you saw in January when you had those three guys playing together that they found something. And it would certainly give Elias Patterson, you know, the best set of line mates that uh, he's had all season. And the results were there for them when they went through Jersey and New York and, and into Pittsburgh uh, on that seven game road trip. So, you know, it's not something that they have to start with. Again, I go back to playoffs and matchups. If you're loading up, I think uh, the other team can counter, you know, with a checking line and see if they can't neutralize. Uh, and so I think that's why Rick Tockett's best interest probably to try to spread his offense uh, around a little bit. But boy, there are situations in games just like putting, uh, you know, Heronic and, and, Hughes out there with like really juice it and you know why wouldn't you so I think it's situational for me and we've seen it from time to time and it hasn't necessarily worked here of late but just because it hasn't worked of late I still go back to the larger sample in January and know that those three guys can come through for you and at some point down the stretch and into the playoffs they quite likely will have to come through for the Vancouver Canucks to have success. Jeff, good stuff. I asked you before. We know exactly who it is tonight. It's Irvan Gafar co-hosting Rinkwide Vancouver with you. Uh, it's going to be a good time. Jeff, thanks so much for doing this. All right, guys. It's always fun being on with you. I'm looking forward to the game tonight. Yep. There's Jeff Patterson. You can catch him, as I said, on Rinkwide Vancouver after the game. Anywhere you get your podcasts. And yeah, it's going to be a good show tonight. Jeff and I had a great show on Saturday. Going to be a lot of fun uh, to see Jeff on Rinkwide Vancouver post game. Uh, Time for our Light the Lamp contest, Harm. And I'm excited for this one because I've had my pick for a while now. It's time for our Light the Lamp contest brought to you by our friends over at Four Winds Brewing. Vancouver is playing Buffalo tonight. We want to know who's going to score the first goal for Vancouver. If you nail it, you could win a $25 gift card to the Four Winds Tap Room located at 72nd and River Road in Delta. Enter by following us on social media, keep an eye out for today's show clip, and comment who you think will light the lamp and score the first goal tonight. Winners will be contacted directly. Check us out at Canucks Army or at Canucks Combo on Twitter, at CanucksArmy.com on Instagram, and Canucks Army on Facebook. And make sure you ask about Four Winds Light Light Lager at your local liquor store or have some delivered to your front door through the online shop at fourwindsbrewing.ca. Harm, Brian Choi saying Carson Susie in the chat. I am going with Elias Lindholm. On the power play, scramble play in front of the net. They're going to get pucks on net on the power play. Elias Lindholm's going to bury it. First goal of the game, Elias Lindholm. Nice. I'm going to go with uh, with Hoaglander. I like it. That's a great pick. And look, in all seriousness, like that's a line you're going to be looking. I'm looking for a lot from that line tonight. You need to see something from Elias Pedersen's line there. Uh, and again, a lot of this goes... The conversation is, oh, it's all about Elias Pettersson. His line mates got to do something too. Like his line mates got to pull up their, pull their weight a little bit more. So anyways, um, yeah, our thanks again to Jeff for joining us. And now let's get to anyone else brought to you by DoorDash. 
It's our listeners' chance to get involved and hit us up in the YouTube live chat. And it's also our listeners' chance to get 25% off and zero delivery fees on their first order of $15 or more when they download the DoorDash app and enter code NATION25. That's all capital letters, NATION, and the numbers 25. Offer valid in Canada, subject change. Terms do apply with Double Dash on DoorDash. You can order from multiple restaurants or stores in the same delivery without additional delivery fees. So everyone can get what they want and need. No additional delivery fees. Crazy stuff. Double Dash on DoorDash. DoorDash. Okay, get your anyone else's into the chat, folks. We're going to kick it off. We're going to kick off anyone else harm with our ideas for the Canucks' best lineups with and without Dakota Joshua. As head coach Rick Tockett said today, they're being extra cautious with Dakota Josh. We don't know when he's going to be back, but eventually Dakota Josh will be back from the hand injury that he suffered when he got into that fight in Chicago. So we're going to go, let, let's pull up our lines without Dakota Joshua first and i'll go first grady you can pull up mine here um my lineup harm i'm not trying to you know i'm not trying to say talk it's got the best lineup he can right now but very very similar to what they have right now like i actually that's exactly the same as what they have right yeah, now i was gonna it? say <laughs> i actually think that's the exact same as what they have right now um I thought I had something different. I, I think the wingers are flipped on the fourth line. I think Pot Colson might be on the right and Oman might be on the left, but that's it. Well, that's 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 the recipe to success right there. It's Oman <laughs> and Pot Colson just gotta switch you're fine. No. Okay, this is this is very, very similar to what they're rolling with right now. And look, I think and I, I the, the one thing I'll say, the one the one thing I'll say is that I'd like to see Lindholm go up, Suter go to the third line. That that might be the only tweak I make to this lineup. But right now, like the lineup I wrote down is actually exactly what they're going with tonight. So, hey, maybe I'm right and maybe Rick Tockett's right. We have the same idea here on the Canucks best possible lineup without Dakota Joshua. I'd say the only thing I want to kind of amend with this one is I might put Pia Suter as third line center, move Lindholm into the top six, and um, Garland moves down to play with Miller and Besser. Just that's the that's I think that's the only thing I'd say about this lineup. The only tweak I'd make to their current lineup, but I do like their lineup right now. I do. I'm gonna mix it up a little. I am gonna reunite the lot of line, and the reason I say this is because first of all, you're gonna get Elias Pettersson hopefully going. JT Miller is the best line mate Pettersson has ever had. You look at their track record together, the on on ice results have been crooked. So I'm going to go with that. And then I'm going to go with the second line of Hoaglander, Lindholm, Garland, a third line of Mikheyev, Bluger, Suter, and then Pod Colson, Oman, Lafferty on the fourth line. Like I said, I think the main point is getting Pedersen going, but also in this scenario, Lindholm has better line mates than Mikheyev and Lafferty. He actually has some offensive drivers to play with. Um, you give him Hoaglander, you give him Garland. Those are two possession type guys that have at least some offensive touch compared to if he's playing with McCabe and Lafferty, I'll be honest, I don't have really any even strength offensive expectations for Lindholm. And then obviously, because you're stacking your top six there, you got a third line of McCabe, Bluger, Suter, which definitely isn't um, isn't sexy, but I think that works as a low event responsible, just don't get scored online. And, and I'll be honest, how much worse is that third line than uh, Lindholm, Lafferty, and McCabe? I'd argue it isn't that much worse. Um, now. I will say I'm I'm doing this as like a temporary spark to try and get um, Pedersen going to find some new combinations. This isn't something that I'd be rolling into, let's say, the playoffs necessarily, because uh, you can afford to do this against, let's say, Buffalo. And you've got Montreal next because they don't have very deep lineups. So you can sort of stack your stack your top line and you're probably still going to be fine with your second, third and fourth lines being okay with their matchups. Obviously, as you run into opponents like Dallas and Vegas later in the season, that's when, for example, the Dallas quote unquote third line, which is really why Johnston, Stankoven and, um, and Jamie Ben, that's where they'll probably feast on uh, some of uh, some of your weaker line lines. But for now, considering the quality of opponents, um, I think this works to kind of give you a spark um, and just get, get a few guys going. Okay, this is interesting that you said this because, Grady, pull up my lineup here with Dakota Joshua because I love your thought process, Harm, of getting a spark going. I'm of the opinion that not only do I think Rick Tockett won't do it, but I don't think they can do it. I don't think the Canucks can go to the lotto line if that's the rest of their lineup with what we saw in your lineup. Like, 
I think it's I think it's fine, but I will point out that the only time we have seen the lotto line to start games, like I'm not just we're not just talking when you and I bring it up here, we're not just talking about late in games and you need a spark putting them together. We're talking about starting games and keeping them together all game. The only time we've seen it this year and the only time we've seen it work harm was then when that third line was absolutely buzzing at the start of January. So I have them in my best possible lineup with Dakota Joshua. Uh, I've got Bluger back centering that line with Garland Joshua, and then I've got a third line of Nils Hoaglander, Elias Lindholm, and Pia Suter. I just think that's a much deeper lineup. Like, I think that's a third line that can compete with some of those top teams, and I just don't think you can afford to go with the lotto line um, if D- Dakota Josh was not healthy, but he gives you so many more options when he actually does return. So like, I look at this and say, this is a lineup that they could take into the playoffs and they could do damage in the playoffs with. Uh, I don't know about playoffs again, just because teams are so much deeper. Again, a big part of it is you're playing Buffalo and Montreal next. Why can't like, th- they aren't deep teams at all. They're like, they're both sort of, especially in Montreal's case, one line teams. I absolutely think if you have a lot of line together that, if Lindholm, you know, like Lindholm, Hoaglander, and um, and 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 Garland would be a totally fine um, second line without Joshua, just for the interim to try and get Pedersen going. I, I think it matters to give him some help, um, even if it comes at the sacrifice of okay, where we're we're going to be ho- trying to hold on for dear life with the rest of our um, rest of our lineup. Now, going to the playoffs with Joshua in yeah like i said it's it's i don't mind it as like a plan b option but i i've got i don't have the lotto line um together which mm. is kind of ironic because you'd think oh if i ha- if i have them together without uh joshua i'd have them with but this is more for a temporary spark the the case that i had for putting the lotto line together um i've got something a little different for um yeah i've, I've got it up here so when Joshua's back in the lineup, I agree that you got to put them together, Joshua, Bluger, Garland, but I've got them as a third line. Um, I've got Suter, Miller, Besser as as your top line. It almost doesn't even matter who the third player with Miller and Besser is. They just always produce. Um, and then I've got Hoaglander, Pedersen, Lindholm. I'm, I, I think at some point, Lindholm, you have to maybe give it another shot with him at uh, at wing because... I want to reunite that third line together when uh, when Joshua was healthy. They just had a different level of chemistry. Um, the way they read off each other on the four check, pressure pox. And so if you're not going to have Lindholm at 3C, then, I mean, I'm not going to have him centering the fourth line. He's got to slot in on the wing, perhaps. Um, and that's where I've got him with, uh, with Pedersen. Hopefully, um, you're able to, to make that work. I find it interesting. I, I like your lineup. I do. I just, I don't like, it, okay. In a perfect world, I'll say in a perfect world or my ideal scenario, Elias Lindholm figures it out and works out in the top six. And I want him to be a top six winger. I said it yesterday. I really, I, again, it, it's such a hard question to answer because I think you need Lindholm to be playing better than he has been to make this lineup that you have work. But I don't disagree that it's a good lineup, especially if you get Lindholm clicking and really just playing like the player that they thought they were getting when they made this trade. Yeah. The concern I had with your lineup with lot line is if you end up, let's say going up against LA and they just go or, or Vegas and they just go, all right, we're going to feed Philip Deneau to the lot line and we're going to go head to head or William Carlson. Look at how effective Carlson's line was against um the mcdavid line in the playoffs in the second round if they just go all right we've got elite matchup centers we're just gonna blanket um and shadow you then in the playoffs if you're able to neutralize the lotto line i'm not convinced they have enough scoring further further down the lineup especially if you're technically penciling in bluger joshua garland i like them a lot better as a third line i don't love them necessarily as a second line in playoff hockey um that would be my only concern but i, I think the point is in either of us, in both of our scenarios, there is some sort of level of weakness, or there is some question mark, or there is some concern because until Lindholm gets going, until you maximize his value offensively, you are a top nine and maybe even arguably a top six forward short. I think that's a great take. I think a lot of this, like we we can throw out line combos, we can talk about playoff potential and who who's going to play against who and who the Canucks might face in round one we can talk about all that the big wild card here is Elias Lindholm like Elias Lindholm has to get going at some point and again if we look at the original lineup 
uh, he is going to be centering that third line and he's not going to have the best wingers tonight, but we'll see how it goes tonight. Uh, yeah, I thought that'd be a fun little segment. Um, let's see if people have any thoughts in the chat here. Um, seems pretty split. Nar said, I'm with quads here, but partially because I think he likes squirrels more than harm. <laughs> uh syndicat lindholm was always overrated this is who he is what do you make of that take harm i think he's got better to show offensively i look i think the hope of getting the 2021 22 version of lindholm that was wheeling it around with Gaudreau and kachak um my hopes are definitely down for that put it this way I don't think he's going to reach the ceiling that I thought he would offensively when they first made the trade, but he's still better than this. Like he has yeah. to be better than this. I think he that's where, where I'm kind of at. Like, but te- expectations are definitely tempered, but the bar is still higher than, than where, where uh, his actual performance level is right now. Okay. This one is about Elias Pedersen. Uh, this one is from Kurt. Karin, I got his name right. For future seasons, does this team just look for a scoring? Does this team look for a scoring winger for PD, or are they just waiting for Lakaramaki to develop? I don't think you have to have both, right? Like I think you can, um, like I think you can, or excuse me, I think you can have both. Like I don't think you need to pick one or the other. You don't need to go out and sign like, oh, we're gonna get a top six forward in free agency, and we're gonna give them a lot of term and you know a lot of money i don't think you have to do that i think you can find kind of a stop gap like i think you can find someone that can play with elias Peterson for the next two years and you know i think you're hoping that Ilya mikhaev has some sort of bounce back here and that you might have some of the answers in house but i don't think you have to decide okay we're gonna wait for le Mackey to develop even though that might be the long-term solution um the thing we always hear about le Mackey is he kind of projects more as a second line winger well, is Elias Patterson going to be on the second line beyond just this season? We'll see. If so, maybe that's a really dominant second line that you can have. But look, I think the long term, you want Elias Patterson being your first line winger. And I think you want to get him some, or excuse me, first line center. And you want to get him some actual first line wingers at some point. Yeah, it should be a priority to get him some help uh, this summer, this offseason. Of course, it's not going to be easy because you're not necessarily going to have a lot of cap space. And you've got other priorities in the sense that you're going to have to almost retool your blue line. You've got a lot of expiring contracts there. Uh, You've got some important decisions on UFAs. There are a lot of priorities to be juggling, but you should be aiming to give Pedersen some more help heading into next season because, look, most franchise centers have more help than Elias Pedersen has had this season. They usually have at least one really high-quality running mate. Oh, absolutely. Um, This one from Roland. If Lo- if Lindholm doesn't figure it out for the rest of the season and the playoffs, then what? Then he goes to UFA. He's going to sign with a team and it ain't going to be an eight by eight. Like it's not going to be an eight by eight. And we talked about this yesterday, so we won't repeat it all. But yeah, that rumored eight by eight contract reported eight by eight contract in Calgary that was turned down. That might come back to haunt Elias Lindholm. But again, maybe he just didn't want to live in Calgary, right? Bring that up at least three times a week. Yeah, I mean, look, there's nothing you can really do. You're you're just going to need to lean on other guys to to step up. Then internally, you're going to need Hoaglander to not just be at a top six caliber level on, let's say, two thirds of every game, like fifty to sixty percent of games. You're going to need him to like be on almost every night, which is a lot to ask for for a player who's only just reestablishing himself this season, who started in a fourth line role. That's going to be the expectation. Um, you're going to need Ilya Mikheyev. You're going to need some level of, hey, can you show us a bit more? Um, sort of almost following up on what he's done maybe the last few games. You're going to need more from him. It's going to increase the the pressure on uh, on a player like Pia Suter. It's going to increase the demands that, hey, once, once Joshua comes back, you need, not just want, you need the third line to get back to the level that they were before Joshua got hurt. Uh, which is part of like that's a question mark for me as well is sometimes you find magical chemistry in season and then for whatever reason if there's a disruption to that if there's an injury you can sometimes put the same guys together again and you just don't get that same level of chemistry like think about you know different circumstances but in 2019-20 for example the lot line was one of the best lines in the nhl 
they came back the next year in that shortened 56 game season, the same guys. And for whatever reason, they just weren't that dominant. They had to be split up. That's when we first saw Miller playing at center as a Vancouver Canucks. So that's something that I'm wondering about as well is I think a lot of us assume that when Joshua comes back, that, um, it's going to give this lineup a massive lift and I'm sure it will help, but it's not a guarantee that they're immediately, immediately going to pick up on the chemistry that they had before his injury. And um, that's something that you're going to need come playoff time. If uh, Lindholm doesn't find his form. Okay. Uh, the chat really thinks Lindholm's ending up in Florida. Few people thrown out the Florida saying uh, he's going to, he's going to follow Kachuk. Six uh, million Florida so. is eight Florida million camp- in Calgary. They got us re-sign um, Reinhardt. Uh, they just re-signed Forsling to uh, to an extension that needs a raise. Um, like they've got their own guys that they need to re-sign, that they need to re-sign. Plus, they don't really have a need for another center. They got Barkov, Bennett's totally fine as a second line center. Lundell's a quality young third line center. They don't need a player like Lindholm. I still think it's Boston. I still, I, I, I know you think the same. We threw it out yesterday. We both think. It's going to be Boston. Okay, RP88. Do you think the coaching staff will tell Joshua not to fight as often when he comes back, given the impact it's on the team? Yes. Uh, unequivocally, yes. I, I don't think Dakota Joshua is going to fight again. Like, I don't think Dakota Joshua is going to need to be told, hey, don't go fight. Like, I don't think Dakota Joshua uh, is going to fight after what's happened here. Like, he fought in a game against Chicago. And at the time, we were all like, yeah, this is awesome. But then you hurt your hand. Like, that sucks. That, that really sucks for Dakota Joshua. And as we know, it has sucked. For the Vancouver Canucks. Okay, Nars got a few heater questions in here. We'll get to the silly one first. You can have $15 million, but you'll be chased for the rest of your life by a snail. You die instantly if the snail touches you and it always knows where you are. Do you take the money? And he also said that the snail knows how to get on airplanes. Uh, yeah, I could probably, yeah, I'd take the money. I would too. I, I, like you can use snail defense. I asked him. He said, you dude, can you can use just hire any... a security team also. You have 15 oh, million. Like... That's a good point. You could hire a security team and have them, you know, stay up. Just, all you need is one guy. Yeah. And he said, we, we're not allowed to harm the snail, which, we, you know, I did ask. I did inquire, but no one wants to hurt any snails. Anyways. Um, yeah. I think we'd both take the money. I think that's really easy. Um, okay. Here's another one from NAR. Rutherford secretly has a genie lamp with one wish remaining, and he uses it to pick any player he wants off another roster to play on PD's wing. Who does Rutherford pick? I'm going to say, not a winger. If Rutherford has a genie lamp and he can pluck any player and put him on the (laughs) roster, he's using the same wish I am, and it is Sidney Crosby, no doubt in my mind. Oh, yeah. 100% because you know he'd be like, (laughs) you know, the championship pedigree and giving these guys. just some experience and leadership been there, done that known, known winner. Uh, yeah. Rutherford would have a bias towards Crosby for sure. Yeah. It's Crosby. It's the answer. The answer is definitely Crosby. Um, definitely Crosby. But, but in the spirit of the question, Harm, is there a winger that you can think of? Like, like a winger, if you had a secret genie, line, not, not a center, like let, let's say this doesn't include Leon dry You can't pick Leon dry Um, No centers. The winger that you would want to play with Julius Patterson. Oh man, there's so many good options. I feel like I'm gonna miss an obvious one. Um, you know, you said Sam Reinhardt. I, I thought about Sam Reinhardt a little bit as soon as you said it. Like I was thinking about this question. But again, if you have a genie lamp, like you can pick anyone. You I don't can, think you pick you Sam can Reinhardt. Aim higher than Sam Reinhardt, even though he's having yeah. a, a great year. I mean, it would be pretty fun watching Kucherov on uh, on Patterson's wing. Um, just in terms of how wickedly Kucherov sees the ice, uh, being, uh, being like a dual threat, like elite shooter and elite playmaker. I think that would be really fun to watch with, uh, with Pedersen plus, and I know this isn't part of the, part of the question, but <laughs> can you imagine what Kucherov would do to the power play as like your fifth guy that you're, you're adding to round the, round the unit out? Um, I know it may not necessarily be the most practical answer in the sense that, oh, like Kucherov isn't maybe the best defensively and he's not the biggest guy and can play off hockey. Um, like Pedersen and Kucherov, do you maybe want like a bigger body like Amiko Ranton in there instead? I mean, maybe, but Kucherov would be a really fun answer. The chat is rolling in with some answers. Syndicat says Matthew Kachuk. 
uh oh, sino chick said p played really well like with kucherov at the all-star game uh karin says kaprizov grim studio says pasternak and we get nar as well said um oh no he said panarin excuse me for some reason so grim studio wrote pasta so like oh pasternak and then nar said bread and for some reason i was like oh that's also david pasternak but obviously <laughs> that's artemi panarin uh so yeah a lot of good wingers a lot of good wingers uh someone brings up brady kachuk i you know i don't think brady kachuk fits the fits the criteria but clayton keller nylander there's so many good options so many good options out there I think we're good on anyone else. I'm trying to scroll the chat. Um, oh, okay. This is just a question that I'll answer. Uh, Captain Canuck, can LeCaramacki join the team for playoffs or did he have to join Abbotsford before the deadline? Oh, actually, I don't know the answer to this. He is eligible for the playoffs. Is he not, Harm? I... I don't know the exact CBA rules on that, to be honest. I think I think he's eligible. I'd have to go read Dave Hall's articles, but he has. I, I'm 90 percent sure he's talked about Abbotsford coming in for. Here, hold on. I can Matt, I can literally <clears throat> find it. Matt and Blake talked about it today, and they were saying he's not eligible for the age. That would make sense because the there was the deadline, and that's why they had to move Pod Colson yeah. down. But uh, I should ask Dave. It's funny, I read the question out because I was like, oh, this is a question. I thought he was going to, I thought I read, I skimmed the question. I was like, oh, it's about if he's going to come over. And Dave Hall wrote about this yesterday. Uh, his team was eliminated from the SHL playoffs yesterday. So now there's de a decision to make. It sure sounds did, like Team Sweden's going to want Did Philip Johansson play like a game or two for Abbotsford last season? Yeah, that rings joining? a bell. Yeah, he, he did, but then he was a healthy Did they suck? The Oh yeah. no, he did play playoffs. No, no, he did play playoffs. He only played playoffs. He played no regular season games. So yes, this is what I thought. Yeah, this is what I thought. He's eligible. He because Philip Johansson yeah, came over. Yeah, three playoff games. Um, yeah. and didn't play in the regular season. Spent the entire year in the ISHL last season. All right, tell Matt and Blake, Grady. You better let Matt and Blake know. You are fake news. <laughs> uh, I was going to say you should. Uh, we should end the show and then you can come back uh, after the final ad read and you can give us the uh, lowdown like you did yesterday. I think people, uh, I, I hope people saw it yesterday because I know when the, the outro plays, a lot of people leave. But yes, I did get the answer from the GM that I texted yesterday uh, to the question we had on yesterday's show. And for those that missed it, I'll read it again. I'll, I'll read the answer again. Uh, what was the question we asked? I have to try and find it now because it's deep in my text. Like, how many? Like, can you trade? Yeah, future draft, draft pick? picks. Like, is oh, there a yeah, limit on my what Ponzi year? scheme? Yeah, <laughs> I thought more about this, guys. Like, I was thinking more about this in the shower, and what I thought about was just that you've got your all your picks for twenty twenty six or no, no twenty twenty seven. You've got all those picks. Then next year, you're going to have all your 2020. Like, you've got all these picks. Just start moving them out. It's The, the picks never end. They're, you're always going to keep getting them. So just keep moving out the futures for all the immediate help you need. It's it's down the line. It's someone else's problem. I used yeah. to do that in franchise mode in EA, NHL. That's right. It's so easy. You get I don't fired know anyways. Fired. Exactly. Exactly. I, haven't, I don't know Benning why I haven't School of Management. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> need, to oh, hire, need to hire Harm on as you, for your analytics stuff. And that one, yeah. Happen. Uh, so this was the answer that I read yesterday. Uh, there's no limit, but no other GM is gonna listen to you if you're like, All right, I want to I want to trade you a 2040 pick. Like <laughs> three to four years is the maximum that GMs will really discuss. Uh, nobody's gonna talk about uh talk about anything beyond that. But he did say sometimes future considerations could mean like a 2040 seventh no, round pick. But here's the thing for like for jokes, if I've got like an AHL guy that is like has no value instead of future considerations i'd be like you know what give me a 2030 sixth round pick and and i'd be like i know you don't care i'm probably not going to be here anyway but just for the memes you know yeah absolutely just for the memes and i think it's that's like an, a great place to close it's it like out. an eight-year-old kid right now <laughs> <laughs> Oh geez! All right, we'll close it out there. A syndicate saying that's the Golden Knights model. What I just described, yeah, it is absolutely. Kick it is. the can uh, down the road. Worry about that bridge else later. Fault. And that's the thing. Like that's with Vegas, they do kick the can down the road, and everybody's like, "Oh, they're gonna have issues this year. They're gonna have issues this year." And then they navigate those problems really well. I trust Jim Rutherford to navigate those problems. So Jim, if you're listening, 
Keep trading well, those picks. That's actually what Rutherford did in Pittsburgh, and it's all catching up to them now, kind of. Yeah. Ron Hexel, so, in all fairness, made it right, worse. Yeah, yeah he, he was did. terrible. Exactly. Was, yeah. Exactly. So if look, Jim Rutherford knows when to get out, man. And I know Canucks fans don't want to hear it, but he knows. <laughs> he knows when it's time. He knows when it's time. And to Kyle get out. Dubis hasn't done much better. He's kind of oh, picked geez. up where they left off. So you wonder, is yeah. that an an ownership mandate? And if you think about it, like they want to go for it because of Crosby, Malkin, Latang. So. Yeah, a bit of a different, wild, uh, unique circumstance there. Get Crosby to Vancouver with some proper management. We All see right. that. We see that in the comments every on both shows that I work on. Crosby to Canucks. Cro- trade, trade Petey for Crosby. It's still. Going. I do have a lot today. of accounts. I do have a lot of accounts oh. to comment. On. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll close it out there for my co-host Harmon Dial and our technical producer Grady Sass. My name is David Grigelli. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of the Canucks Conversation. Canucks conversation with Harmon and Quads brought to you by the Toyota BZ4X. The BZ4X is fresh look is just an added bonus to its range since you can drive up to 406 kilometers on a single charge. That's enough to get you from Kitsilano to Whistler or Kamloops to Kelowna and back and still be home in time for the game. Now that's what we'd call electric. The best part, by choosing electric, you can get up to $11,000 in rebates and incentives The BZ4X are in stock and selling quickly, so make sure to visit shoptoyota.ca or your local Pacific Toyota dealer to get your hands on one. Canucks Conversation is live Monday through Friday, every weekday at 2 p.m. over on the Canucks Army YouTube channel. Make sure you like, subscribe, and interact in the YouTube live chat every day with us, folks.